If it were possible to achieve the dream of people such as Ray Kurzweil and create a world where even the plants and rocks were fused with intelligent nanotechnology, how might such a thing be done? Very notably and quite obviously due to their microscopic size, the prospect of doing so without the knowledge of a vast amount of the population must be seen as utterly plausible. But how could such a mammoth undertaking be implemented? What delivery system could be employed to ensure the widest and most effective method of reaching the subject population? The phenomenon known to the alternative research community as chemtrails and referred to by the British and United States governments as geoengineering or climate remediation is perhaps one of the most controversial topics on the table today. Even though the practice of climate remediation is widely admitted to by governments, there are many who remain sceptical. And generally the two main questions brought up by those who are opposed to the concept are 1. If there was any truth to the idea, then why would the perpetrators be spraying themselves? And 2. The phenomenal cost of such an enormous undertaking. People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather, leaving what you see there, and they call that a chemtrail. This is of interest, not just in this country, but uh, European countries and frankly all over the world. A lot of folks interested in it. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth system. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality and do this in just a jet in a very simple way. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. Because nanoparticulates are potentially self-replicating, the cost of producing them is actually quite negligible. As for the question as to why the perpetrators would be spraying themselves, well that answer is in fact a very simple one. These people want transhumanism. In fact, when one truly considers the transhumanist agenda and it begins to sink in that chemtrails seem to consist of nanoparticulates or smart dust, then the last piece of the puzzle falls snugly into place. And it is far from inconceivable that were the global population to be infused with programmable nanoparticulates, then when these tiny machines are switched on, they will simply do what they are programmed to do. And that what this may be may also be largely due to what other genetic codes have first been introduced into the host. We have more than tripled the numbers of doses of vaccines we're giving our children in the last quarter century. Up to 15 by the age of six. Why are so many highly vaccinated children so sick? The elites, those who can afford to carry out practices such as chemtrails, generally don't eat processed or genetically altered food. And it is extremely unlikely that they are subject to the same rigorous vaccination regime as the general public. If mankind is indeed ingesting nanoparticulates without their general knowledge, then how might such machines be controlled or switched on? In answer to this question, one only needs to realize that it is now a long established fact that when anything occurs within the human experience, ultimately the information travels around the body electromagnetically. All our five senses, along with any emotional information, 
is all interpreted by the brain via these electromagnetic signals. Therefore, it is also an established fact that man can be influenced and even controlled via electromagnetism. Metallic salts have made our air conductive. This means that we and everything around us can transmit and propagate energy. The air is no longer neutral. I think the smart meter is a very good move for the company. For, just for the customer aspect, I mean, they can keep more real-time information on a day-to-day -day basis. The huge awakening that has been seen in recent times leaves little doubt that mankind and consciousness itself is in a state of evolution. But there also exists compelling evidence suggesting that there are certain forces at work who wish to control the direction this evolution will take. The second group of materials found in these environmental samples is unidentifiable fibers. And I really want you to appreciate the meaning of unidentifiable. These fibers have been sent to sophisticated laboratories and there is nothing, nothing in the databases that match them. These are fibers, we could say, that do not exist in nature. People around the world are developing lesions on their skin that ooze and produce fibers. This is known as Morgellons syndrome. Tissue samples cultured from ordinary people without this ailment contain and grow the very same fibers. When these fibers are cultured, they produce colonies of filaments. You can see the extension filaments. And these colonies continue to grow and reproduce, branching out into more filaments and more colonies. The filament cultures can be grown from saliva samples, tissue from the skin, mucus, urine, blood, from animals and people, regardless of the presence of the Morgellons condition. So where do these fibers or filaments come from. Airborne environmental samples that were collected by Clifford Carnicom in 2000, the year 2000, gathered at high altitude on a mountain in New Mexico, showed the presence of those fibers whose structure matches exactly the tubular filaments showing up in our blood, tissues, and skin. Additionally, the samples collected by Mr. Carnicom showed what he calls and was called in biology desiccated erythrocytes. This is a multisyllabic term, but it means dried red blood cells. So, why are dried red blood cells in the air? See, nano cells are real small, a thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. Six months' time, I could have a hundred million people converted ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people who buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. Those unidentifiable filaments, he has observed the formation of red blood cells and submicron sized structures. So now you've got a filament making its own red blood cells. The engineered cells, the red blood, very, very tough, withstanding excesses of heat and chemicals, indicating that they are designed to endure almost anything. He has put them in a Bunsen flame, he has poured bleach on them, acid, and they still endure. In addition, they are able to replicate, growing outside of the body in a Petri dish. This is highly sophisticated technology, going on by itself, not in a laboratory. People with advanced Morgellons syndrome started with fibers coming out of their skin, and they're now observing very strange crystalline forms and metallic devices, plaque structures, even grooved metallic devices. On the right, you'll see one device, the front and the back. The fiber strands that you see here were made of cellulose and GNA. GNA is DNA's chemical cousin. It's a nanotechnology building block. The nanostructures contain additional properties not found in DNA, including the ability to form mirror image structures. Here you have a nano array, a tiny device used in biotech for DNA hybridization. And on the left, you see a diagram from 
an industry website of a nano array and on on the slide you can see actually two of them she's marked them with red X's that came out of her body looking exactly like this so we begin with the emergence of basic filaments followed by more complex structures so what processes are going on here are these materials combining to form devices that are working together inside us what is happening to our biology and remember that Tissue samples obtained from ordinary people who have no Morgellons symptoms, no lesions, can be cultured to produce the very same filaments found in people with Morgellons. So we would have to conclude that Morgellons is like the canary in the coal mine and that only some people are exuding the materials. And could that be because their bodies are rejecting it while our bodies are integrating it? There has been a force that is mostly unseen in control of this planet for an extremely long time. And evidence very much suggests that this force is attempting to manipulate the evolution of human consciousness that is currently taking place. It is very likely the same force that first reduced mankind to the impaired state we now find ourselves in. Where our pineal gland is closed, thereby cutting us off from our higher senses, and where our DNA is 97% dormant, whereby each person is reduced to operating to only 3% of their actual capability. When one examines the evidence and steps back to take in the entire picture, there can be no doubt that the vast majority of human beings live their lives quite literally in a socially and biologically induced trance. And it is due to this trance-like state of the people that we now find the world in such a degraded state. Therefore, the solution becomes clear. Mankind must awaken. But how? How do we transform the collective human trance into wakefulness? How do we bring about the mass awareness of the people? And what steps can be taken to allow both humanity and the earth to once again return to a natural state of abundance? Clearly the first step is for people to understand and accept the truth regarding the current condition of mankind and the urgency of addressing the situation we are faced with. But even when people know the truth, as many do, most are simply waiting. Waiting for social or financial Armageddon. Waiting for December 21st, 2012. Waiting for ascension or waiting for the rapture. And due to this lack of positive and decisive action, while people wait for redemption to be delivered to them via an outside source, the destructive machine of modern civilization continues to grind slowly forward towards its inevitable conclusion. Obviously, it is extremely important for mankind to truly grasp the depths of the problems we are facing and to the peril that our collective failure to deal with things has placed us in. And this peril includes not only the human race, but the entire earth and all life upon it. Because if mankind allows the ship of state to continue sailing in its current direction, within possibly three to five generations, we are very likely to have allowed the creation of a world that will no longer support life as we know it.